in our second piece of this Organizational Standards National Webinar Series. Um, today we're going to be focusing on collecting that comprehensive community needs assessment data. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we're at the top of the hour. And I am Courtney Kohler. I'm a senior associate with the Community Action Partnership. Um, and generally on these webinars, we also have Jarl Crocker. Um, he's not on this one today, but he'll be conducting the one on Monday, November 13th, on um, analyzing the community needs assessment data. So as you can see here, we have gone through a variety of topics with this webinar series. And as I said, we're on our second piece of the series. Um, so last week we focused on planning for your comprehensive community needs assessment. Today we're going to be focusing on collecting the data. And then next week we're going to focus on analyzing the data. And then lastly, we're going to look at how to communicate your community needs assessment. So the agenda for today, we're going to um, kind of give a little bit of context to this, um, talk about some of the connections with the community needs assessment. So just a little bit of a review from the planning webinar. And then we're going to go into stage four of the community needs assessment process, which is about collecting the data. Um, we're going to be talking about quantitative data, qualitative data, agency data, um, as well as mapping uh, resources and assets in the community uh, and making sure you're looking at the various systems and connections throughout the community. Um, and then we're going to take a little time for questions um, and then I'll provide you with some resources at the end as well. Um, so it's important whenever we're thinking about the community needs assessment, um, both within planning as well as um, just collecting the data that we really um, are intentional about how it connects with the other processes within the agency. Um, so as you can see here, this is um, basically a piece of the Roma cycle. And so we're looking at how the needs assessment fits with the strategic plan as well as the community action plan, um, which are all requirements of um, CSBG elig eligible entities. Um, and so the uh, needs that are being assessed should always be reflected in the strategic plan through the um, outcomes and strategies and services that are being provided. Um, so a little bit about Roma, I just mentioned it, but um, this assessment piece that we're focusing on through this series is the first stage of the Roma cycle. And it really helps us to determine who are our customers, what do they value, and what outcomes should we aim to achieve. And so the assessment is really that foundational piece of all of the different phases of the Roma cycle. And we want to make sure that assessment is not only just a point in time activity, but it really is an ongoing process. Um, and it's something that we use to really connect all the pieces with the Roma cycle. Um, and it should be reflected throughout. So it should be reflected through planning. It should be reflected through the achievement of results. Um, and then, of course, in through the evaluation process as well. So another thing to consider as we're looking at collecting um, the community needs assessment data is looking at the category of organizational standards on community assessment. And so there's a couple standards that actually directly relate to the type of data we want to collect. So first of all, we want to make sure that we're including um, current data that is specific to poverty um, and its prevalence to gender, age, race, ethnicity for the service areas. So this means we want to make sure we're collecting demographic data in all domains, as well as demographic data that informs decisions about the selection of programs, services, and uh, delivery strategies that are being um, put into place. And then also we have standard 3.3, which talks about that we want to collect and analyze both qualitative and quantitative data on the service area for the um, community action agency. And so we want to make sure that both qualitative and quantitative data is um, collected for each domain, that qualitative data is used to explain the quantitative data, and that the data is analyzed to really tell a story of the poverty that's present in the community. So we're going to get a little bit more into um, the quantitative and qualitative pieces um, to really explain those out more throughout this webinar. Um, so just to kind of let you know where to find our tools and resources, as well as where to find a recording of this webinar after, um, after the webinar. So we generally post a recording within two business days from the live event. Um, so you'll be able to access that. Um, right now we're taking those or putting those under events and webinars. Um, you'll see the series that we have and then 
the past webinars will have a recording link instead of a registration link. Um, but we also put um, our items under the Tools and Resources tab. And so you can find um, previous recorded uh, webinars. You can also find um, TA guides on community assessments, as well as a wealth of other resources. And so one of the things I want to bring to your attention is that we have technical assistance guides on each of the three, or each of the categories of the organizational standards. So category three, community assessment, has its own technical assistance guide, um, and that's available on our website under tools and resources. Another thing I want to bring to your attention is um, a NASCAP tool on um, a guide to a comprehensive community needs assessment. Um, and so this can be found on their website, and we have a link to it at the end of the presentation. Um, so whenever uh, there's a PDF of the slide deck available, after the webinar, you'll be able to just click straight to it. Um, but it really goes through this process um, that we talk about in pieces um, and outlines some really good information on guiding you through this whole process. So these are the five stages of the community needs assessment that we're really kind of focusing on throughout this webinar today. Um, and so we're going to really be talking about the collection of the data, what type of data you want to collect, and what to keep in mind um, during the collection process. Um, so if you were a participant in last week's webinar, we talked about um, planning for your needs assessment, but also creating your data collection plan. Um, and so up to this point, you would have already created that data collection plan. Um, and so all of this stuff is kind of what would be within that plan. So you want to make sure you have that before you start actually collecting the data. Um, so now we're going to go ahead and start going through these different pieces. And as I said in the beginning, we are going to be taking some questions at the end of the webinar. Um, and so you can type those into the chat box at any time throughout the webinar, but then we'll pause uh, towards the end to address those questions. Um, but as I said, feel free to type those in as you have them. Um, through the chat box that's provided. All right, so collecting the data. Um, so whenever you're first looking at collecting the data, you want to um, create the timeline and assign the responsibility for each piece of the data collection process. And this is something that can really be done during the planning phase, and we talked a little bit about it last time as well. Um, but you want to make sure that this is all lined out before you actually start collecting the data. And then, of course, your next step is to collect the data. So with creating this timeline and assigning responsibility, um, we want to make sure that there's um, adequate money available and capacity for the agency to conduct the data collection they're going to be doing, um, establish the timeline in which this will take place. The previous webinar did have some examples of some timelines that you can use um, for when you would want to conduct the quantitative data collection, when you would want to engage in focus groups, and that sort of thing. Also. Um, you want to define the agency staff or consultant roles that are going to be present within the collection of data. Um, it can be very overwhelming if only one or two people are trying to do all of this themselves. Um, so we always suggest taking, taking a team approach to the community needs assessment, um, especially the data collection process. Um, and it is very helpful, too, for a variety of people to be able to see the data and information that's being collected. Um, because there's different perspectives based on different roles within the agency um, from, you know, about where this is coming from and what it means. Um, so as we go into talking about analysis next week, um, you continue to use that team in each phase of this process um, to really gain the rich information. Also, recruiting partners and participants throughout the community. Um, so determining who's going to do that and who you want to recruit. And then also, of course, choosing and finalizing your data tools that you're going to use through the process. Um, so as you collect the data, um, the three-year time frame that we kind of operate under with the community, um, the community action organizational standards um, is really good because it kind of allows for that identification of trends. So if you're able to kind of stay on this three-year cycle um, and then updating each year, then it's good to be able to look at those trends over time um, to see how things are moving or progressing. Also, you want to be able to sequence your data collection to start with the quantitative methods first. So we're going to talk about this a little bit more um, on how you would want to sequence your data collection. You also want to pair data collection methods with types of stakeholders um, and data collection needs, 
as well. So you want to do surveys maybe for customers, key informant interviews for community partners, um, so that you're getting the right information from the right people. Then also you want to sequence your quantitative and qualitative methods. Um, for example, you might want to follow up surveys with focus groups to be able to dig deeper into the information you're gaining through your surveys. And then lastly, you want to consider those connections to the strategic planning process. Um, so how are you going to make sure that this is all reflected as you start planning for um, the outcomes you want to achieve as well as the services and strategies that you will provide? Okay, so as far as um, the types of data that we want to collect, uh, we talked a little bit about when we mentioned the organizational standards that we want to make sure we have both qualitative and quantitative data um, for each domain, and we also want to have demographics for each domain. And so whenever we're talking about domain, I'm going to go to the next slide quickly, just to show you what we mean by domain. So we want to make sure that we're looking in the domains of the CSBG Act, for example, um, and that we're collecting um, community needs assessment data within the realm of employment, the community, education, the income levels in the community, housing, nutrition, health, et cetera. Um, and as you can see here also that our Community Commons online tool that helps you gather your quantitative data, it reflects a lot of these different um, domains that you need to collect data within. So um, that was done purposely to be able to ensure that um, a wide variety of data is being collected um, and not just, you know, under population profile or um, housing, um, but that there's that variety there. So going back to talking about this a little bit more, um, we want to try to include data for each domain. Um, so looking at that demographic data, um, this is age, race, ethnicity, and gender. Um, and these are all things that are required by the organizational standards to show throughout your needs assessment. Um, you also want to show that you have geographic data um, within each domain. So this is kind of that distribution of needs by census tract or zip code, um, comparison to regional, state, and national data. Um, which is all information that you can access through Community Commons. And then there's also trended data over time. Um, so looking at data from the last three years um, and, or even 10 years um, as you kind of go through these to really see what that movement over time is um, with the needs in your community, whether things have gotten better, gotten worse, um, and maybe what factors are contributing to that. Okay. Also, you want to make sure you're engaging others um, in the data collection, so looking at other sectors within your community. Um, a lot of times it seems to be easier for us to go to other nonprofits in the community, but we want to make sure that we're also um, engaging the public sector, um, you know, Department of Human Services, Economic Development, et cetera. Um, also that we're looking at the education sector, um, which a lot of times they have a lot of resources. Um, around data that they've already collected. And so it can be really useful to look at what information they've already collected, what research they've already done um, that could be beneficial to your process and data collection. You also want to look at the business sector. Um, so this is an important sector to make sure you're um, regularly kind of partnering with and staying in the loop with, um, but letting them know that you're conducting this needs assessment, um, that seeing what data they might have that would contribute to that. Um, can be really good because they can really help get the information out about the community needs assessment and can be vital partners down the road as well. And then also the faith community um, is another good one to make sure you're looking at. Um, community-based organizations, so grassroots organizations, sometimes they have community needs assessment data already um, that can be very valuable to your process. Um, and then also looking at any kind of media print that sort of thing, making sure you're engaging those media partners, um, because ultimately in the end, when we talk about communicating your needs assessment, um, they're going to be very beneficial in getting that information out for you. Um, so any way that you're able to kind of, um, you know, develop these partnerships early on in the community needs assessment process um, and create that buy-in in what you're doing, um, it can go a long way throughout um, whenever you need things later on. So we said that we're going to talk a little bit about the sequence of data collection. Um, and we want to make sure that we are doing this intentionally and strategically um, so that our data is as rich as possible um, and so that each type of data collection that we're doing kind of feeds into the next. 
So ideally, you want to start with your quantitative data, um, just to kind of get a numerical picture of what's going on in your community. Um, the best way to do this is really through community comments. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later if you're not sure what it is. Um, but it's an online tool um, of aggregated data, data sources that makes it quite a bit easier for you to collect your quantitative data. Um, also, looking at reports and agency data is also part of this quantitative assessment. Then next, you want to use your quantitative data to be able to add your specifics to your survey. So an example of this would be to provide a little bit of context for your survey takers. Um, you might say that, um, you know, 500 children are living in poverty in some county in your service area, um, and then ask a question related to that. So you can kind of be able to provide a little bit of context by providing some numbers or some percentages um, to kind of give people an idea of what you're talking about or um, give them an idea of how things might rank for the community. Then also you can use focus groups to get the story behind the numbers um, from the quantitative data as well as the information you're getting from the surveys. Um, so this really helps you to explore that data you've already collected once you get to the focus group um, stage. Then another example is that you can use the key informant interviews um, with experts or community partners in your community um, to help with the analysis process. So usually key informant interviews are some of the last type of qualitative data collection that you're gonna um, that you're gonna do. And then um, a lot of times you can conclude with a community forum. Um, this is a way that you can kind of gain additional input once you already have some results and build awareness. Um, as you start to go into the planning process. Um, so another um, side note is, though, that you can actually do community forums a variety of ways. So generally, community forums are larger groups of people, um, and you get more broad information from a community forum. So you can do the community forum on the front end of the qualitative data as well, um, and you can gather kind of those broad strokes of information of the needs in the community. Um, and then start to narrow down through that other policy of data, such as surveys, focus groups, key informant interviews, um, and then even do another community forum at the end to be able to kind of announce your results from your community assessment. So there's a couple different ways that it can be done. This isn't, you know, the only right way, um, but the bottom line is that you want to make sure you're very intentional about how you're sequencing your data collection. And these are just some best practices on how to do that. Okay, so as we go into quantitative data, um, first of all, we talked about this a little bit in the last webinar, but we want to um, really confirm what we're seeing through quantitative data. So we're looking at numbers, we're looking at statistics, demographics, um, kind of that social landscape in our community. But this can be very time consuming sometimes. And so um, the solution that the Community Action Network has is, was to create this web-based data tool. Um, so back in 2009, um, the University of Missouri, uh, through two organizations called CARES and IP3, as well as the Missouri Community Action Network, um, developed this web-based data tool. And so now today, there's a few different state associations that have their own state-based tool. Um, and then the National um, Community Action Partnership also has um, the National Community Commons Hub that you're able to join free of cost and access um, a variety of different data indicators as well as a mapping tool. Um, so it kind of provides this comprehensive data all in one location. It's a trustworthy source and it frees up time to be able to focus on the primary data collection and assets, so the qualitative data collection afterwards. So this is kind of what it looks like when you get to the Community Commons site. Um, it's communitycommons.org. Um, if you're looking for the website, it's also, you can get to it through our website as well under tools and resources. Um, but this is what it looks like when you get there and you can learn how to use the report tool. Um, so there's a guide on how to use the tool. You can also then start a new assessment um, and it's loaded up by state and county. And then you can also learn about the data. So you can learn what data indicators are included. And within the CAP Hub, there are about 39 indicators and it's mostly all national level data sources, of course, since the nationwide tool. Um, but you can, some of the data sources are the Census Bureau, the American Community Survey from the U.S. Department of Labor, 
and so on. Um, so then you can see the data categories here. So these are those domains that I talked about in a previous slide um, that align with the domains of the CSVG. So this is um, a picture of some information that you can get out of Community Commons. Um, you get these charts um, that come out of it, and it can relate to each um, county in your service area. And so you can get the percentages and how um, rates are, are in those different communities. Um, then as far as the comparison to um, state and national data, you get these neat little dials here that tell you um, how your service area ranks in relation to the state or national. Um, and then there's different charts and stuff as well that help, help to tell the picture of, um, of the data in your community. Then there's also a mapping tool. Um, so this can be really neat, especially as you get into the analysis process. Um, or to just get a really good visual representation of your data. Um, and so this is kind of an example here of Southeast Missouri and um, something that you can do where you can layer the data. So you're looking at households with no vehicle percent by track. Um, the red portion is where over 8% have no vehicle, the households. Um, and then you see the blue dots where there are major supermarkets. Um, so as you can see, if you're looking at your screen on the lower left corner, um, this is where um, kind of the highest number of households have no vehicle, but yet the major supermarkets are located um, a pretty good, you know, distance from that area. Um, so then that might um, identify or visualize for you what the transportation issue or the food access issue is in that area. Um, so it can be very useful to use this data tool. Okay. Um, and then as we kind of bridge from quantitative data to qualitative, um, and definitely encourage you as you're looking at quantitative data, even if you're not in your community needs assessment process yet and you haven't used community commons, um, go in and just see what it can do um, because then that can help you plan for your next needs assessment cycle um, and what data you can get out of it. So then after we've looked at those numbers and we've determined kind of what that um, landscape is as far as what the poverty rate is in different areas, um, all of that kind of stuff, then we can start digging into and exploring that data. And so with the qualitative data, um, we're really looking for those narratives, the themes and perceptions, um, also looking at available community resources or assets, um, looking at what are those unmet community needs, and also, what are the current barriers to accessing services? So there's two types of qualitative data that I like to um, point out. So there's external, which is, of course, going out to the community and gathering the data from different people and groups. Um, but then there's also internal. So you don't want to forget about your staff, um, your board, and, um, and also your agency capacity to address the needs. And so making sure that you're surveying your staff, because especially frontline staff, um, have a wealth of information as they're with the clients living in the community every day. Um, and then also um, your board members as well. So making sure that you're gaining that qualitative information from inside your agency walls too. So here's kind of a picture of how you can sequence this. We talked about some examples of the sequencing earlier. Um, but after you've done your quantitative data collection, you have your numbers, then you can start to use those numbers and put them into surveys. You use your survey results to then um, determine some specific questions that you want to dig deeper into for the focus groups. Um, then you can move into key informant interviews to really talk to experts in different areas about the why of, you know, what's going on in the community um, and what their perspective is. And then, of course, you can use those community forums to get that awareness out and kind of almost publish your results as a needs assessment and just gaining any further information that might help for planning. So we're going to go through each of those pieces of qualitative data collection, talk about what it is, um, give you some pros and cons to each, and then also some tips um, as you execute those different types. So surveys are really about collecting the primary data um, from individuals who collectively constitute a representative sample of the community. Um, and so you want to make sure that, you know, one of the big questions with surveys a lot of time is, you know, how big should my sample be? 
Um, and it really just varies, but you want to make sure that it is generalizable to the picture of the entire community. So some different pros um, for surveys, they can collect information from a large number of people. So you can distribute a lot of different surveys um, to get um, a lot of different information. Also, the data from representative samples can be generalized to the community at large. Um, so if you make sure you have the right sample, then you can get that um, generalized picture. Also, it can collect a variety of types of information. So this might be behavior, beliefs, um, that you're being able to look at. Then as far as some cons to surveys, um, they can be expensive and labor intensive, um, but there are some, some tips that I'll share as well that can maybe help cut down on some of that. Um, also, it may require extensive follow-up to generate a sufficient number of responses. So sometimes it is a struggle to get the right number of surveys and to get that sample that's generalizable to the community. Um, and then also you have to be careful, um, you know, to design the survey to be able to get the right information back. Um, so be able to produce that reliable data. Um, and then, you know, another con is that sometimes surveys can be very lengthy. Um, and so sometimes that turns people off. But sometimes if you go too short, then um, that can also not give you enough information. So there's just kind of that balance between the short and long of the survey. Some different tips for surveys. Um, you want to make sure that you're using existing surveys um, or have a professional that's able to assist you in, um, you know, be able to design those questions. Um, a lot of times your local university or college can help with the survey design a little bit. And a lot of times they'll be real, um, you know, without a large cost to it if you're able to create some connections there. Um, brevity is generally best. Um, because long surveys oftentimes won't get completed in entirety. Um, you don't want to just survey clients, so you want to make sure that you're, you know, definitely surveying your customers, but you're also surveying the community at large to get that whole perspective. Um, of course, that's how it's most generalizable to the community. Um, also, you want to be able to engage partners to help, so work with your community partners to get the surveys out to their constituents as well. And then also your surveys, they could target um, residents of low-income neighborhoods, um, and that might be how you get um, some information on the unmet needs or the underserved population. Also, um, being able to get representative samples of key stakeholder groups um, and really looking at the community at large. Um, so then we look at who to survey. Um, so former clients as well as current clients are good. Um, you can mail paper surveys to all clients that you have on file based on the information you have for their addresses. Um, you can also provide participants um, the survey of that agency facility. So every time they come in for an appointment, you can have them fill out a survey if they haven't already. You can also utilize electronic surveys that clients can complete on agency computers um, or electronic devices. And then also you want to survey other residents in the low-income community. So capturing households that aren't associated with the community action agency, um, you can do mailings to low-income census tracts um, and housing developments, or asking those partner agencies to help you distribute the surveys. Um, so a word of caution here, though, is that these respondents cannot be the only source to measure unmet needs, and they really kind of represent a narrow market of residents who currently access community organizations. So, if you're really only looking at your clients as well as other clients from organizations that serve low-income people, then it's not a representative sample. So how to collect survey data? Um, there's different types. So you can do online, which a lot of people are doing nowadays because it's much easier to aggregate. Uh, of course, you can do the mailed paper surveys. And then you can also conduct surveys over the telephone. Uh, a lot of times, um, shorter surveys are much easier to do um, through that method. Then some other ideas, you can put a survey in a newspaper, um, hand them out at shopping centers as people are entering the door, um, or even include in utility bill mailings or any other mailing that your agency is doing. So then your survey framework. Um, so you want to make sure that you're um, kind of looking at clients and customers, so inquiring about both the needs of individuals as well as families, um, so not being exclusive of either of those. 
also looking at community organizations. So their resources or assets that they have or that they lack, um, as well as, you know, have they or are they participating in reducing or eliminating services? Um, and if so, what are they? Then also um, looking at what are the most challenging issues uh, that low income households will face. And then questions about the perceptions of the community action agency. Um, you want to look at, um, you know, what does the community action agency do well? So asking that through your survey, um, as well as how could the agency improve the services? Because um, those can be very telling to um, your service delivery strategies um, that you're currently doing or that you might like to employ. So then there's focus groups. Um, so these are generally led by a skills facilitator to keep the group focused. Um, and it generally, it always should be a very focused discussion. Um, so it should be planned ahead of time with specific questions. Um, you know, there's a very specific discussion topic. So you want to make sure that it's not too broad focused. Um, the group's composition is very important. So being very intentional about the people that are in the room, um, creating a safe atmosphere for people to talk so that people will open up and share. Um, and then also it can be used to collect qualitative data that's not captured by survey. So again, those narratives and explanations for things. So some pros and cons of focus groups. Um, a lot of times these are low cost. It um, doesn't cost much to get, um, you know, six to eight people together to discuss a certain topic. Um, it's a good source of qualitative data because it really digs deep into certain issues. And it can be more formal and controlled. So um, you can really facilitate a good conversation. Um, and community forums are more just kind of open town hall type setting. So then there's cons. So generally, you do need a highly skilled facilitator to be able to put this into place. Um, the groups don't um, constitute representative samples a lot of times because you're looking at such specific people to be in the room that would know um, some more information about the issue. And um, they really shouldn't be used to gain consensus. So you're going to get different opinions in the room and always explaining that at first. Okay, and some different tips. Um, you want to limit focus group size to about 10 to 15 participants. Um, I've even seen lower than this as recommended, but I would definitely not go above 15 people um, just because you want to be able to have enough space for everyone to talk in the room. Um, and and really keep it that tight focused discussion. Also, you want to use that experience facilitator um, and also a recorder. So you want to have somebody in place to be able to take notes that's not facilitating at the same time. You want to prepare about five or six questions to guide the focus group discussion. Um, so you don't want a whole lot of questions to be able to try to get through. Um, you want fewer questions, so each question can be spent uh, uh, with more time. And then you also want to assure that participants keep their individual responses um, confidential. So they're aware that nothing is going to be um, labeled with their name um, so that they feel open enough to share. So the group structure, um, it can conclude or include a, an issue definition of the current situation regarding um, the issue. So it would be the agency's interpretation of the issue. Um, but letting them know kind of what that is up front, um, letting them know what the problem size is or that scope. So a lot of times that can be described with the quantitative data that you've already collected, as well as some of the survey results. Um, you want to kind of give a basic cause and those contributing factors um, and really look at those and ask the participants what those are, what they think those are. Um, you want to talk about available resources or untapped resources. Um, so looking at both sides, what's available, what are the assets that the community have, and then what are some that are underutilized. And then also seeking out new approaches and ideas from the people in the group. Um, so as far as possible format, um, there's different issues and concerns. Um, you know, you could ask about issues and concerns about adolescent substance abuse. Um, so you might talk about maybe the availability, the community tolerance or gangs, those are some things that could come out of it. Um, you could look at barriers in addressing um, adolescent substance abuse. Um, so that could be your second question. Um, and then these are some things that you might kind of get out of that. 
Um, and then you're looking at maybe another question could be uh, community strengths and resources for change. Um, and then these are some answers you might get out of it as far as churches, youth organizations, that sort of thing. Um, and then you want to look at what are those alternatives or solutions. So that would be another question that you could ask around. Um, so this is just kind of an example of the format um, of how you could kind of categorize your questions. Okay, so then moving to key informant interviews. Um, these are the one-on-one -on -one interviews with individuals who represent important community constituencies. Um, so generally they, you know, have a very informed perspective of that field of work. Um, then you can, uh, this can really help to focus the needs assessment on the particular issues of concern. Um, and it can also provide information about the community organizations and available resources. So, of course, there's pros and cons to this approach as well. Um, generally, it is very low cost because um, you can simply pick up the phone and conduct the key informant interview um, or simply meet in person. Um, you can also um, establish connections with the key individuals and agencies that could be assistance in the future. So, this is a lot of times these interviews are a tool to create community partnerships. Um, one of the, some of the cons, though, um, is that generally you want to have a structured conversation, so you do need to kind of plan ahead for that and have specific questions to ask, just like a focus group. Um, you want to have a pretty skilled interviewer to keep things on track. It can be time consuming, um, especially just depending on where the conversations go and how many of these that you conduct. Um, and, you know, there also is that um, possibility of the professional bias that some key informants might have. So always kind of keeping that in mind um, and identifying when that is kind of coming up. So some tips um, to key informant interviews. Prior to the interviews, you do want to prepare a set of open-ended questions um, to guide the discussion. Uh, you want to be prepared to follow up initial questions with those probes um, to be able to elicit more detail. So probes don't always have to be asked within an interview, but you kind of have those backup questions if you're not getting um, kind of the full response that you're wanting from the interviewee. Then also you want to be ready to pursue unexpected leads um, that might emerge through the discussion. Um, so not always sticking to your script. Um, you do want to keep it focused, but if there's something that comes up that is particularly interesting um, or that you feel warrants more discussion, um, then you definitely want to take that opportunity. Also, a lot of times two people are better. So same with the focus group. Um, you want to have kind of that facilitator as well as the recorder. Well, here you want to have the interviewer as well as the note taker. Um, so being able to have somebody else on the line or in the room um, can be beneficial. And then lastly, we look at community forums as another qualitative technique. Um, again, these can go kind of at the very beginning of qualitative data collection um, or at the end or both um, because they work to um, gather a variety of community members to involve them in defining and discussing the needs. Um, they can be used to assess the community concerns at first, kind of those broad perceptions and reactions, um, but then they can also be useful to um, help raise public awareness in the end um, and be able to kind of publish and announce your results. So some different pros to community forums. Um, these can be inexpensive, um, they're easy to arrange because a lot of times it just takes kind of getting the word out. Um, you can raise awareness about both the agency as well as the issues um, affecting low-income individuals and families. You can also um, help build community ownership of the issues, so especially if you use the tool towards the end of your data collection process. Um, this is where you can really start to create some buy-in after you have those results to share. Um, to people joining kind of the cause and getting in on the solution. And then it might identify new concerns, so things that you hadn't thought of before um, by being able to gather the variety of people together in the room. So the cons though, um, you don't really have a lot of control over who comes. If you're, you know, if you're wanting that variety of people to come um, and you're having to advertise it in a variety of ways, you're gonna get a lot of um, different people in the room um, and the group might not be completely representative of the community, even with the variety that's in the room. Um, it can be hard to manage such a large turnout with people trying to talk over each other. 
Um, so keeping that in mind and having a plan in place on how to maybe address that. Um, and then you might not be able to provide an in-depth understanding of the issue. Um, you're really just looking at, of course, those broad um, pieces of information. So some tips for community forums. Um, to get a good group together, you want to widely publicize the meeting. Uh, make every effort to reduce barriers to participation. So you might be able to offer child care or transportation. Um, these are some things you can do for things like focus groups as well. Also, use skills facilitators um, so that they can help stop discussions when they need to be stopped um, or probe for additional information. Um, you want to establish and enforce ground rules in the very beginning um, so that people feel comfortable and safe. You also, you don't want to rely on community forums to serve as the primary data source. Um, they're very much just um, kind of gathering, um, again, those higher level issues and you're not really able to dig deep into the issues through this, so they have to be supplemented with other data collection techniques. And um, again, you, it'd be best to use a note taker um, and you could also even record the meeting as well. Um, with recording the meeting, you would want to let your, your participants know that it is being recorded um, just, to, uh, just to make all of them aware and be transparent. Okay, um, so then, of course, there's other types of data to collect. And as you're hearing about all these different types of data, it's not required that you collect data from with all of these different techniques. Um, so one agency might uh, decide to do quantitative data collection, um, surveys, and focus groups, um, as well as looking at their agency data and mapping out their assets and resources in the community. And that's completely acceptable. Um, so the, the organizational standards, they say that you should include the quantitative as well as the qualitative, but it's not prescriptive on which type of data collection method that you have to use. Um, it's good to have a variety just so that you're not only using surveys um, because there's different types of information that you can gather from each. Um, but don't feel overwhelmed by all of the different types, um, you know, because you don't have to use all of them. Um, so these last different types of data to collect. Um, so always making sure you're looking at your agency data as well, um, an inventory of community assets and resources, as well as kind of that overall system of services in the community. So we're going to talk briefly about each one of those. So the agency data, uh, you want to use whatever data system or methods that you have um, that you're tracking, you know, those clients that are being served and what programs are being utilized. Um, to look at who is being served in our community or in our agency. Um, so that's the demographics that you're looking at. Um, then also what programs are being utilized. Um, and so this information can really help to feed into that next planning process um, and also see what needs your agency is currently addressing um, and maybe how effective those are. And then you want to really compare that agency data that you have from your own databases um, with the quantitative and qualitative data that has been collected. Um, and so places that you can find this agency data, of course, the agency's own databases, the CSVG, IS, or in your report, um, or any other tracking device that is, is present in the agency. Um, another piece of this is making sure that you're um, looking at the community assets and resources um, and taking an inventory of what is available currently. Um, and the main reason that you want to do this is because as you determine community needs, the Community Action Agency doesn't have to address every community need that's found. So you might determine that maybe there is a wonderful health system in your community that is already addressing a lot of the health needs in your community. Um, and so being aware of that and even noting that in your community needs assessment um, is a very good idea because that way you're kind of noting that the agency doesn't have to take care of this um, and maybe a stronger partnership could um, be created with the health system, but there wouldn't need to be any um, action or implementation of a service by the agency um, because it's already present in the community. Um, so these are some different, um, some different areas that you would want to look at as far as mapping assets. So are there any community colleges or four-year institutions in the area? Those are definitely resources and assets. Um, also looking at any hospital or health systems. 
um, any major industries that are maybe potential partners on workforce development, um, and then any networks of service providers. Um, so looking at other nonprofits in the area, other human service um, organizations to see what they're doing and what assets are out there available for people in relation to the needs in the community. And then you want to be able to ask, assess the community system of services. So this is really looking at what are those gaps in services, what are the underserved populations, also how do all the services that are available connect and coordinate. Um, so what does that service integration look like in your community? Um, so how easy is it for uh, clients to access services or what are those barriers? Um, also, you know, the, of course, the huge challenge that we all have with sharing data and information. Um, so what are those barriers that are present or some ways in which that can be facilitated a little bit better? Um, and then those concrete suggestions for improving service integration and delivery. So asking people what those are. So this is, although you might not look at this as, um, you know, sometimes you don't look at this as data per se, but it is important information that you need to gather um, to really put that big picture together with your community needs assessment. And this is kind of where how you get to that comprehensive assessment. Um, so in summary, there's a lot of different data pieces that you want to make sure you're collecting. Um, it doesn't have to be overwhelming, though. But this is really how you create that comprehensive picture. So you're looking at quantitative, you're looking at the statistics and the numbers. Qualitative, so you're looking at the narratives, the themes, perceptions. Um, agency data, so you're looking at what you're already doing, who you're already serving, community assets and resources, what's available already, and then the system of services. So how is it all connecting and coordinating, and where are there gaps? So that is data collection in a nutshell. Um, the next piece that we'll be going into is um, analyzing community needs assessment data, and that's on November 13th, so it's this coming Monday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, and Jarl Crocker will be presenting that. And then on November 20th, we'll be um, focusing on communicating your community needs assessment. Because um, once it's all done and analyzed, um, it doesn't just sit on the shelf. You want to make sure you are utilizing it and communicating it. Um, so you can register for these webinars on our website. Um, and you can go to communityactionpartnership.com, go to the event staff, and then go to webinars. So now we'll go ahead and pause for questions. We have another 10 minutes uh, remaining to address anything that has come up. So I'm going to take a look at the chat or question box to see if anything has come up. Okay, so I see one question about um, the fact that there's other organizations in your community that are required to prepare health and needs assessment, health needs assessment plans, um, would we need to repeat the data that they collect in their report um, or just cite the existence of their report? Um, so yes, actually this is what I was talking about earlier when I mentioned the other, um, the other sectors that you want to make sure you're looking at for data. Um, it was one of the um, early on in the webinar, but there's a slide we can review um, about that. But what, basically what you want to do is see what other community needs assessments are out there. Um, you want to look at whether there are health needs assessments. Um, so this part about engaging other sectors in your data collection. Um, so these are some really great sectors to look at as far as other um, people that might have needs assessments out there or might have data. And um, definitely use this. There's no need to recreate the wheel whenever you're doing your data collection processes. If other people have already done health needs assessments or community needs assessments, um, talk to them about what they found. Um, look at how recent the data is. And it can most definitely be cited in your community needs assessment. Um, so I think the only thing I would caution you is really about how you cite it or how recent it is. Um, so you want to make sure that you are so um, before you're utilizing it, as well as um, whether it conflicts or is similar to the data that you have as well. But absolutely um, look at those as well. 
Okay, uh, another question is about sample surveys. Uh, so I don't think we have kind of an organized collection of sample surveys. I know there's some out there throughout the network, um, but I don't know that we have kind of a lot of them, you know, in a bank here. But um, if you would email me, my email information will be at the end of the webinar. Um, we are trying to build out a little bit of um, kind of a resource page on our website with community needs assessment resources. And so that might be something we can include there. Um, and I can definitely give you some examples. So if you want to email me at the end of the, after the webinar um, for some examples of surveys, um, I, I do have some resources on that. Um, let's see. All right, and we do have um, a couple people mentioned last week's webinar and being able to access that. Um, it is linked on our website, but we have heard there's been some error issues with that. Um, so we'll get that fixed. Um, so check back to that link um, maybe in a couple of hours, and that should be fixed then. Um, and we can also make the PDF of the PowerPoint available online. Um, if you want it very soon after this webinar, um, just email me and I can send it directly to you. Um, but otherwise, we will post the PDF of the slides on the website um, as well as the recording. Um, okay. Trying to sift through some of these other questions. Um, about sample questions for surveys, um, yes, I do have some resources on that. There's actually going to be a resource to show you here in a moment on that, as well as the NASCAST guide that someone asked about. And, okay, so basically for, yeah, for the surveys, if you have specific questions about the surveys, email me, and I do have some resources. Um, as far as that goes, we'll also be posting kind of a resource page about community needs assessment to our website. Um, and then, of course, with the questions about the slides and the webinar recordings, uh, we always try to post those within 48 hours of the, um, of the live webinar. Um, and so we'll try to make sure that that is done uh, by Monday morning, since we have a weekend coming up. Um, but and because there is some converting that the webinar has to go through to get on YouTube. Um, but yes, we will be posting the recording as well as the slides to our website. Um, and what we've been doing is we've been posting it under um, the webinars and events page. And then where the series is listed, where you can register, you can also get the recording and the slides of the past webinars. All right. Well, I think that is all I see as far as the questions for today. Um, so again, um, I'll show you my contact information as well as some of these resources. Um, but the community toolbox, if you haven't accessed that before, um, chapter three is all about assessing community needs and resources. Um, and there are a ton of sections in there that go through different pieces of the community needs assessment process. Um, so the link is here in this uh, PowerPoint. You can go straight to it. Um, or you can just, if you Google community toolbox, um, it's a resource with KU. Uh, then it'll come up in the Google uh, search. Also, um, the Roman Next Generation Training Series, there's a specific segment on setting, setting the stage for data collection. Um, so this is your data collection processes with your agency data that you're collecting um, from participants in your um, agency as far as you know, what you need to collect in your agency databases for the CSB GIS or in your reports. Um, but it does just have some really good information about data collection in general. So the reliability, um, how clean your data is, the storage methods. Um, so that might be helpful for you if you're looking at agency data collection as well as the community needs assessment data collection. Um, so the video and slides link is here. You can also go to tools and resources on our website and go to Roma. Um, and then there's here's some general um, community needs assessment resources. So, of course, that technical assistance guide on category three of the org standards. We also have um, NASCASP has their guide to a comprehensive community needs assessment. 
Um, so this is a very good guide um, that has been produced by a national partner, and so I do encourage you to check that one out. There's also two state community needs assessment toolkits um, that can be helpful. So there's one from Texas as well as one from Missouri, um, and those walk through a good process of conducting your needs assessment as well. All right, and then here is our contact information. Um, so I'm Courtney Kohler. Feel free to reach out to me if you had questions on the surveys or if you needed the PowerPoint um, today. And of course, Gerald Crocker is also available. He's the Director of Training and Technical Assistance here at the Partnership. Um, and again, he'll be presenting on Monday about analyzing your needs assessment data. So thank you all for joining us today. We appreciate it. Um, and don't hesitate to reach out if you need to. Thank you.